Well, without further ado, our speaker for this afternoon is Mr. Eric Badrach, who probably needs no introduction. He was here on Friday evening. And then one of the things that Eric's long been known for is his passion and his knowledge base on keeping and breeding Corydoras. And that's what he's going to tell us about today. So thank you, Eric. I, 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 uh, I'm super ecstatic that I was asked to speak here. Glad to be here. I'm glad all you guys showed up uh, to, to hear the talks, too. Hope you're having a great weekend. It's a great event. So anyways, um, my talk is going to be on Corridors Catfish. Um, you're going to hear some of my philosophies thrown in with a lot of this, too. But one of the biggest things you'll hear me say is to avoid a, a disaster. And uh, what I mean by this is don't keep all of your eggs in one basket. Uh, if we, if we, anytime Regina and I get new fish, Regina has her own fish rooms. I have her, her fish rooms, yeah, too, and I have mine. If we get something in that's new, unusual, or unique, we'll split them up. Either I'll put one group in one tank, one group in another, one of my tanks in another room, or I'll even give some to Regina. You could go as far as doing that, or you could give some to some of your buddies and other hobbies that she knows are in the same interest as you. The idea there is if you have a, a tank crash or you know, you have a power outage from a storm and you end up losing a tank of fish or something, you still have this rare fish somewhere else. You have another source of it. Um, good friends with Stefan Tanner, you may, you know, last night I referred to it quite a bit. Stefan would bring stuff back from Europe that's not in the U.S. He would spawn them and then say, hey, Eric, I got some stuff on here. You're interested in them? From the first spawn, he would give me six fish. And he would give me, usually with it's a pleco or quarries, three of the biggest, three of the smallest. Because most often the males grow quicker than the females. Um, normally when it grows up it's almost an even sex ratio and then I now have some in the, in, the, in, the, in the hobby he has them and he was in Columbus Ohio at the time I was in Pittsburgh so split them up don't keep all your eggs in one basket that also applies if you spawn fish you have a group of eggs or fry or something don't put all the fry in one shoe box to grow them up split them up into two shoe boxes so if you had that accidental oh man I overfed that shoe box and you lost them all you had them in one shoe box if you had them split up you may not lose both of them. So better to be safe than sorry. You know, don't keep all your eggs in one basket. Uh, a lot of the philosophy, and a lot of the people know me with my talks, a lot of it is be the fish. What, what, what does that fish do? What happens when, when that fish is in the wild? Um, grab a beer, grab a glass of wine or whatever, sit back in your recliner, close your eyes and be the fish. It sounds silly, it sounds childish even, right? But man, your eyes will just open up when you start thinking about it. Uh, things you want to think about is your water, your pH, temperature, hardness, trace elements, uh, your current, how much turbidity, you know, debris in the water, uh, seasonal changes, daily changes, temperature, you know, night and day. These are all things we just take for granted. You know, um, it, it's funny, we talk about acclimating fish and how people want to get the temperature adjusted. And I'm sure a lot of you people have been in swimming pools before, right? If you go down in the water, you go down four feet, the water's going to be cold. And when you swim up to the top, the water's hot. Quarries breathe air. So they could be at the bottom of a deeper water, and they, they go up to the surface to grab a gulp of air. They're going up through hot water, and they come back down. So how much are they really affected by these, this sudden temperature changes? Probably not affecting them very much at all. So these things are the things, things to think about. What, you know, what be the fish? What happens daily? What's your substrate? Are, are you on sand? Are you on mud, gravel? Uh, corridors tenienti are found over big cobblestones. Um, they're hard to catch. They're found singly. I mean, they're, they're just a, a very, very hard fish to collect. Uh, a lot of these talks that you see, like uh, uh, Joel's talk, it was a lot of sand substrate on the bottom. And you, a lot of people assume, well, that's what everybody keeps their fish on in aquariums, but that may not be where they're found at in, in nature. So you got to do some research and find out where, what's going on in nature for that specific fish. Um, lighting. One of my biggest pet peeves are a lot of the commercial stands that you buy, the wrought iron stands, they have the, the, the frame where you put a tank on top and then you can fit another tank usually the same size underneath. And people will put the tanks up, you know, us breeders, we don't put gravel in it to make it easier for maintenance and everything. And then they'll put a tank underneath and they'll put strip lights on each of the tanks. And then you walk into the fish room and the light from the tank below is shining up through the bottom. So think about it, in nature, does the plecos and quarries have sunlight underneath of them? And that's the most, most furthest thing from a natural environment ever. If you want to breed these fish, they have to be relaxed. It has to be a natural, a natural setting. And it's not by having light underneath of them. 
Always spray paint the underside of your tank or use contact paper or gravel or whatever so light doesn't come up. In nature, light's from the sun and it moves from left to right, east to west, and it'll change a little bit, but it's always an overhead lighting. So again, a thing to keep in mind. Uh, a lot of this right here could probably goes into play with breeding a lot of fish that people have never spawned before. And it's seasonal uh, uh, time changes, you know, the amount of, of daylight that the fish gets during a, a season. Uh, it's, it would just be the logistics to doing that test and doing it for long term to see what effects actually works is difficult. Nobody that I know has ever tried it. It would just be intense. Food. Food is a really big thing. Um, you know, I hear a lot of people say, well, I feed a, I feed a flake food. And my, to me, flake food is like pepperoni pizza. It has pepperoni pizza, break it down, has something from four basic food groups, which in theory is a balanced diet, right? You got the tomatoes from sauce, you got the meat, you got the bread and cheese and everything. So you're getting a balanced diet in theory. But if you're a little kid, a little baby, and you get you know, pep, uh, pepperoni pizza three meals a day your whole life, you're not going to grow up to be a big and strong kid, okay, or a big, strong person. But you're eating a balanced diet doesn't work that way. You need to have a variety. Every, everything that they eat has a little bit different nutritional value. You know, we, we talk about eating uh, insects or whatever, you know, insect larvae, and people say, oh yeah, you know, uh, crustaceans. I feed shrimp, okay? Uh, insect larvas. Yeah, I put mosquito larvae in. In South America, where quarries are found, there's, there are insects that they haven't even described yet, that they haven't even found yet. Those insects all have larvae that usually find their way into the waterways, that when the fish eats that, it's eating a different nutritional value than that insect's larva, than that insect's larva, than that. I mean, it's just unlimited. If you, my theory or my thought is that if you would feed everything that was available in the hobby to your fish, it's probably like less than 1% of what they could get in the wild. So the more variety you can give them, the better off you are. Um, I probably have 50 different types of foods Count dry foods, uh, you know, gel foods, uh, live foods, frozen foods, frozen earthworms. We'll get into that a little bit later. Are the foods, and, and you try it every time you feed, grab something different and give it to them. Now, by doing that, you can. You know, a lot of people say, "Well, that's that's a lot of food to buy." If you're only going to give it to them once every two or three weeks, you can buy a small can of 50 different foods. That's going to last you a heck of a long time. So you know, you, you have six, ten, eight, ten, eight, ten, twelve tanks, whatever. So the the more variety, the better. And, and seasonal, how does diet change seasonally? You know, a lot of times when, when you, uh, uh, fruits might be falling in the water, you don't think of quarries eating any types of fruits, but there's a time of the season where, where fruits are gonna be falling off of trees, or leaves are falling, different types of leaves are falling into the water, or the, 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 the wet season. You see it in Joel's talk, how high the water gets. Now you have different vegetation that's submerged in the wet season, it wasn't in the dry season, that those fish can now feed on that they, you wouldn't think they would be eaten, but they're offered it now. So, you know, that changes seasonally. And it's all be the fish. You have to think about these little things. All fish breed, you just gotta figure out the trigger to make it work. Okay, what happens different from day and light? I mean, that's kind of obvious. You know, am I sleeping, am I spawning? Do I go to the shallows? Do I go to the deep? You know, are the predators out? You know, uh, what happens? You can be the fish, figure it out, walk it through. And then how do I go about spawning? You know, that's kind of a million dollar question everybody needs to, to figure out. But again, all fish spawn, you just gotta hit the right thing. Another one of my big philosophies is, can it hurt me, can it help me? And I, I do a lot of my life is based on that. Sometimes with fish, you gotta kind of make the decision quick. But this scenario here, you have a, a brand new quarry, never been spawned before. You have a 10 gallon tank, you have about 80 to 100 eggs. Uh, some of the eggs are on the glass, most of the eggs are on the glass, some are on the plants. You have eight fish in the group. Okay, you've been working with them for six years and they finally spawn. What do I do? Okay, quickly, you gotta kinda start thinking that no quarry shows parental care. So just leaving them go isn't gonna help any situation. It can only hurt you by leaving the, feet, the, uh, the adults in there. So um, leaving them with the parents is no good. They're gonna eat the eggs most likely. If they don't eat the eggs, sure as heck they're gonna eat the fry when they hatch. They don't show parental care. That's just food for them. So get the parents out of there. Um, just hit on that. Uh, okay, so by removing the parents now, what happens? Corridors have a, at the base of their pectoral spine, they have a gland that produces a protein toxin. Some are more toxic than others. Um, if you go in there and you start chasing around the tank, they can start releasing that toxin. Not only can they poison themselves, but they might actually poison the eggs. They might kill the eggs off. 
Uh, if you ever get spined, if you ever get hit by the pectoral spines on them, sometimes you'll get, hey, you know, I got, got pricked a little bit, it hurts. Sometimes you get hit and it's like a bee sting. I mean, I, I tried talking Ian Fuller into, if you ever see Ian's book, he has the, uh, the egg intensity on how sticky the eggs are and he rates them and everything. I told Ian this for, 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 get, for, uh, for uh, he was thought I was serious too. I was just doing this as a joke. I says, Ian, you need to put on a scale how intense the, the pain is on getting spine. And he kind of looked at me and I says, because you know, some fish you get spine, it doesn't really hurt. Others, it's things like a, like a bee, you know, a yellow jacket hit you or something. And he's looking at me and I says, so Ian, you need to take your quarries and just start stabbing yourself with them. <laughs> and then rate it from one to 10. And he kind of actually thought about it for like 30 seconds and he started laughing, you know. And, uh, but you know, it may still be in his mind. He may be goofy enough to try it. But, uh, but anyway, so what you want to do with this toxin, kind of off track here a second, but it's important to know, if you're going to catch quarries, what you want to do, if you're going to ship them, or even if you're in a fish shop, get some water out of the tank before you do anything. Set that water aside. Uh, you know, a bucket or a big specimen cup full of water, set it aside. And then go in and catch the fish. If you're in a shop, a lot of times you get, you know, high school kids, whatever, that aren't very skilled at fish catching, they have to chase that quarry around the tank. That's kind of a good thing because they're scaring the daylights out of that quarry and secreting the toxins in the tank, okay? Have them catch the fish out with water, you know, not the stuff you set aside, but another cup of water. Put the quarries in that container, have them walk it up to the bagging station and don't bag them right away. Go buy your other fish or your fish food or something. Every time, go walk by the tank every two or three minutes and ting it, snap it with your fingers or kick it if you're having a bucket, kick in the bucket. Scare the daylights out of them so they secrete all the toxins. And then take the original water you pulled out that was from the undisturbed tank, take the quarry, net the quarries out, put them in that water, and then bag them. I've already seen in shops, and then, then you don't have to worry about the toxins. They have to regenerate. They have to rebuild up that toxin. I've already seen uh, Mark Soberman. He's not here this weekend, but he's a big quarry guy up in New York. We were at a shop, and in the very back of the store, they had these three pretty good-sized quarries, two-and-a-half, three-inch quarries. And uh, we caught the fish. We looked through it, and they, they only had three. They were a, kind of a contaminant. The, the girl caught them, took them up front, said, I need more water. She went to the back, bought more water, came back, and it looked like soap suds on the top of the water, and two of them were already dead. They poisoned themselves that fast, and it, 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 they didn't live. We, they dumped them back in the tank, and two bellied up, one ended up coming around. The, the, the severe result of that, after they poisoned themselves, you'll get these big red hemorrhage marks on them. And uh, it's just that their reaction to the poison is self-poisoning. So take that extra step to uh, get rid of that toxin on them. Okay, enough about that. So, but anyways, that toxin may, may affect the eggs or the parents. If you move them into another tank, you may get them out of the, the, what it took you six years to get that right conditions to spawn them. You move them, you just disturb them. They may never spawn again for you. Are you gonna get, are you gonna damage them? You know, netting them out there's a chance of dropping them, there's a chance of you getting spined. And do you have room to put them? Do you have another tank to put them in, or are you just going to say, hey, I'm going to net them out and I'll throw them in that tank over there with my African cichlids, you know, until I can set something up for them? Not good. Do you remove the eggs? Usually by removing the eggs, you won't damage them. They're pretty hard. Um, they're, they're, they're sticky. If you wait about two minutes, three minutes after they lay the eggs, they get hard enough with, you can just take your finger and roll them off, or you can use a little piece of yarn mop. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, the, the plants or the eggs that are on the plants, it's easy just to remove the plants. And again, split them up, put them in a couple different hatching containers. Uh, separate the eggs from each other. By removing them by your finger, a lot of quarries will spawn in a cluster. If you scrape them off with your finger and move them into a hatching container, separate the eggs so they're not touching each other. That will prevent if one fungus is, the fungus doesn't invade the next egg and contaminate it before it has a chance to hatch. Lower the water level. And uh, if you talk to a lot of these quarry guys, they'll tell you that when they go collecting, um, Hans Evers told a story about years ago, that he went specifically to the location where a certain quarry was found. All day they spent looking for this quarry and they found like five of them. And he ideally wants to get 30, 30 pieces when, they're, when he's collecting. So they were camping on the shores of the, of, the, of the bank of the river. And I guess they're probably sleeping in hammocks or something. And of course they're always drinking beer. So middle of the night, he had a, he had a pee. So he gets up and he says, everybody, you just pee, pee in the river, you know? He walks on, it was a sandy beach, and he walks up to the, to the sandy beach and he starts peeing in the river. Well, while he's doing that, he starts hearing, he hears all this clicking. Well, apparently he had like a mag light, mini mag light, 
around his neck. He grabs the flashlight, he shines the flashlight in the water, see what's making this noise. There was like three or four or five thousand of these quarries all at the surface, right in, in like four inches of water. He says, I tried to pee on every one of them. He went down his neck and went scoop, he caught like 50 of them. Because they all came in at night. Now you take that one step third, further. Most of your quarries spawn at night. It's a sandy beach. Where are they spawning? They're spawning in the sand, in shallow water, in the sand. Just about five years ago, did people start realizing that quarries are spawning, burying their eggs in the substrate. Talk about labor and tents looking for quarry eggs. Got to go in sand to look for them. That's just, just crazy. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but, so what you do there is you lower the water level. So when the eggs hatch, they're not in deep water. Deep water might cause too much pressure and, 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 and damage the egg yolk, the egg sacs that are on them or they may, they may not develop properly or cause some internal problems. So lower the water level because it, most likely in nature they're in shallow water. And try different techniques. You know, one doesn't work one time, try something different. Okay, sex in them, pretty easy. Females are gonna have the wider body. Males are gonna have a narrow body. Males usually have more pronounced fins. Long pointed fins, short round pectoral fins. That also holds true on the, um, the pelvic fins. Here's a uh, long pointed on the males full and round like a basket on the females. And the females, when they lay eggs, they use that fin to catch the eggs and hold them. So they, they're adapted to be round to, to act as a basket to clutch the eggs. Um, again, colorations, if there is a different coloration uh, 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 between males and the females, the males are usually, you're gonna usually be more colorful. The males will usually have more nicer finish, more adapted or more high fins, more longer pectorals. This more, more intense finish, more elaborate finish, I guess you should say. Diet. The magic food to feed them is live black worms. High protein. Um, it just gets them in the condition like better than no other food. And the neat thing about it is when you put the black worms in the water, they'll live. They clump up. They'll get underneath the rocks. You can actually see this little thing sticking up there like black worms that made its way under the rock. And those fish can just go eat whenever they, they, they get hungry. They just go pluck out a couple worms. Now, I hear a lot of people, especially killifish people, say, no, no, you, if you feed your black worms to your fish, they'll eat and they'll blow up. And it's like, come on, you don't eat and blow up. These fish in nature can eat whenever they want. And I'm often, like I said, no two bites are the same. They eat an insect larva, they eat a crustacean, they go pick up some algae, they eat a baby fish, whatever. It's no two bites are the same. But food is always available. When you put black worms in as a that treat food once a week, the fish just go, wah! They go dig, they just jump into them because they love them. That's when they can overeat because you're basically starving the rest of the time. But if the black worms are near in there and they can eat when they want, then they don't get freak out when you put the worms in there and you just have a fish that is maximum capacity of eating. It's always in good condition. So I like the black worms. Live daphnia is a good food, but you've got to be careful. Don't feed too much of it. The hard shells of the daphnia can get in their digestive tract and cause a, a blockage. And it, it happens with baby brine shrimp, with fry. Uh, make sure when you siphon it off, you don't feed hatched shells and you don't want to feed eggs that didn't hatch. You want to take a special little care for at least the first two or three weeks to when you separate the shrimp, let's get the live shrimp. If not, you, if you get a, a problem where the fryer getting, looks like a bubble in their belly and they get real huge and die, it's because they're getting a blockage of some sort. It's fairly, it happens fairly often. Um, Anything that you would feed, this is why I feed the adults. I, I take a razor blade, you can chop up earthworms or run it on a grater for smaller fish. Uh, live bloodworms I feed a fair amount of. Any of the, uh, the mice or shrimp, things like that, you can just chop it up to the size of the fish, make it bite size for them. The cubes, it's a little bit more expensive, but a different variety of foods. And of course, any of the rapashi foods are good. Um, quarries are scavengers. You know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, cor quarry cats are I have a couple of them in the tank for cleanup crew, or I keep one in every tank for a cleanup crew. You're not going to spawn them if you have one. And to say that I just have them in there as janitors or cleanup fish, they're real fish. They're just not that thing that you need to clean up. They're real fish too. So you keep them in a school, keep them active, um, varieties of foods. I don't know how I got on that, but anyways. Um, tube effects worms. This is probably, the black worms is my number one choice for uh, feeding live, for feeding live foods, best foods. Number two is freeze-dried tube effects. And what I do with those cubes is I'll grab three of them, three of the cubes, I'll put them in the water, submerge them into the water, squeeze them, try to squeeze them a little bit different angles a couple times, 
So they suck up a little bit of water, take them out of the water, and then try to squeeze the water out of them. And they'll, it'll roll into a ball. When you drop it in the tank, it'll sink right to the bottom. And it looks just like the tube effects work. The, or the blackworms. The, they have a strong odor, and fish in, 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 this, in your tank, the opposite of a 55 gallon tank, will just spaz out when they see the tube effects worms. Excellent food, they, it really attracts them to, to eat, and it's a good food. Again, all different types of, uh, of foods. Uh, I feed a lot of meaty, meaty foods to the quarries. They're opportunistic feeders, so in the wild, they're gonna be picking on a little bit of everything, but they're eating a lot of crustacean, worms, things like that, dead fish, they'll pick on stuff like that and probably a little bit of vegetable matter. So the more variety, the better. And a little bit of variety of everything. Again, the more you can give them, the better. Water quality. Um, a good rule of thumb is my tap water in Pittsburgh is pretty bad. They're doing more cell shell drilling. The tap water source is, is terrible coming out of the rivers. I have the water comes in and it runs through two um, pre-filters. The bigger one, the first one catches the bigger material, second one catches smaller material. And then that's a, a 20 inch, um, impregnated, uh, real fine impregnated uh, carbon block. It's good for 150,000 gallons. It removes chlorine, chloramines, everything like that. It's great to use. That gets rid of a, a lot of the bad stuff. Um, if you don't know where your quarries go, most of them are in soft acidic water. So start with water that's 6668 uh, six, 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 um, pH, uh, yeah, a, a, a neutral pH 6867, six, like I said. And uh, temperature usually around 72, 75. Put them in that and then research to find out exactly where they're found and where you should be. Um, good things to change to, to drop that pH. You see Charlie's talk, he talks about using the tea. This is an old time recipe. That's back from 1956. They were using tea bags to uh, bring the pH down. I use oak leaves as well as Charlie does, alder cones. And you can use RO water, make RO water to re remove all those unknown variables that are in your tap water. Water companies, I hear this story. It doesn't matter if you're in California or Maine or Iowa or Minnesota or Pittsburgh. You'll do, draw tap water and you'll smell it. You know, it's different, it has, it's cloudy, whatever. And you call the water company and they'll say, nope, ain't done nothing different than we always do. And I hear it no matter what, they'll just, they'll tell you the same thing and you know there's different stuff going on. So uh, our own system will eliminate all those unknown variables. And then you add what you need to it to make the water what you want. You know, if you want soft acidic, these things you would add. My normal setup, I use 10 gallon tanks. I'll put a colony of six, eight fish, uh, palliatus type size quarries. Um, again, be the fish. I've, I've got to think of what's going on in the wild. I use natural sand that I find from the local stream. It's been tumbled and smooth and everything. And it's not going to affect the barbels of the quarry, which comes into important play when they're spawning. I put some oak leaves in there for the leaf litter. For the, it's detritus for them to hide through. It's fried food if I miss a spawn. Uh, they'll hide under it, it brings the pH down. I use uh, Nubiuses, uh, Java fern, and Java moss. The roots of the Anubius is a different texture than the root of Java fern. The leaves are a different texture, some are more rigid, some are more flimsy, and different quarries will spawn on different textures. So you have to off, you don't know what they spawn. You know, when they spawn on your glass in your aquarium, I'd say that, that I call that, a, it's a non-natural spawn. Because there ain't no glass in the wild. So what are they using instead of glass in the wild? You gotta think of that and put that in there. Uh, kind of a neat thing is Weitzman eye, Corridor's Weitzman eye. When they first came out, I was trying to breed the heck out of them. You know, I, I tried everything. I had females who were huge, and I couldn't get up to spawn. And I had a, a, a big ball of yarn floating. I had some yarn uh, floating. I had a ball of yarn sunk in the tank. And I had rocks and caves and anubiuses and things like that. And if they were, just weren't spawning. And I talked to other people and they're like, oh yeah, I had no problem spawning them. I start talking to the guys, they, the, like three guys I talked to said they spawned in Java moss. And uh, I said, well, you know, they said that it was a ball of Java moss in the middle of the tank. I just see them swim over the top and they lay their eggs in Java moss. So I'm thinking to myself, well, I got the, the Java or the, uh, the, the moss or the uh, mop in there. Same thing, right? I took the, the, the mop out, I put a ball of Java fern in, or Java moss in there. Within about five or six days, they spawn, they swim over it, and they kind of press into the Java, Java moss because it, it probably has the right texture. The, parent, the females know that they can embed the eggs down a little bit further, and it was soft and easy to do, and they spawn. And it was just the matter of putting the right uh, material, spawning material in there for them to spawn. So something that simple might be the catalyst to get them to go. But uh, label the tanks. I put the label on what fish are in there. 
Anytime they spawn, I immediately when they spawn, I'll take the, the water parameters, temperature, pH, hardness, things like that, put a little note on there saying, I did a 50% water change the day before, or night before a storm or something like that. Make some notes so you remember what, what happened, and, and you'll know the conditions you were at when they spawn. That's, the, that's really important. Uh, give them some place to hide. Um, Again, plants and leaf litter. Uh, the leaf litter, quick story on that. Uh, uh, Ingo Seidel was out looking for a, a quarry, and they, uh, they were on the river where the quarry was found. Excuse me. And the same thing, they were spending all day, they were finding just a few numbers of them. So right next to where he was collecting, there was a cut out of the bank. And it went back about five or six feet, and it was about five or six feet wide. And it was, it was, it was shallow water, it was only about six inches deep. And there was some leaves in there. So, you know, they're catching, they're using sains and, and, and uh, hand nets and everything to try to snatch the, the quarries out of the, out of the river, not have, again, not having much luck. Well, every now and then they would look over and they'd see the, 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 that shallow six inches of water. They would see the water get disturbed. And one of them noticed that it was the quarries. Remember I told you they breathe air. They have the auxiliary air breathing system where they come up and gulp air. Here it was the, the quarries they were looking for were coming up, working their way through the, the little bit of leaf litter, coming up for that gulp of air and then going back down. So one of the guys reached over, he just sat there. When one came up, he grabbed it. He's like, holy cow, this is what we're looking for. These are the quarries. So they said, well, we'll just wait for them to come up. So they waited 10 or 15 minutes, you know, and it's caught like one. So Ingo says, you know, Ingo's, what, six foot or so. Ingo says, just let me get the same, and I'll get in there. I can, with the same, I can cover that whole, you know, four foot wide with the same. I'll just get in there in that little six inches of water, run the same in, right? He gets the same, he goes over, and he steps in the water, whoosh! the water comes up to his chin. <laughs> so when they talk about a lot of leaf litter, you're talking like four and a half, five feet of leaf litter, and then five, four, five, six inches of water over top of it. So he got back out of the water, and he sat there picking them out one by one all day. So, you know, you think leaf litter, putting three or four leaves in there isn't a whole lot of leaf litter, you know? And uh, if you remember the story I talked about, Robert Badruch, and they had the corridor scrisillus I mentioned last night. His tank was filled probably halfway. It was like a 45 cube, two foot by two foot footprint. It was filled about halfway with leaf litter. And those Cori gracilis were just spawning there and they were newly hatched dry with adults and every size in between. And there was hundreds of fish in that tank. So it provides great cover for the quarries and it's a food source for them too, for the, for the small fish. Uh, the rock formations that I use for the fish to hide is so they could get out away from the light. They get under the cave. Uh, this is Corridor's Longipennis eggs. And this was actually the underside of the rock. And what had happened was, remember I mentioned, you gotta watch the fish, you gotta see what's, what's normal, pay attention to them, so you know what's, no, know what's normal, know what's unnormal, if they're acting funny. So if you, have, if you look at a tank and you see you have a, a fish, the female is just huge, she's round as can be. She's sitting there, and when she rests, one pectoral spine's way up in the air, and she'll swim and stop, and then she'll, she'll tilt to one side. She's huge, she's ready to spawn. So make a mental note, say, keep an eye on that tank because she's ready to spawn. You go down one day, and you, I had two of them in the tank. Both were heavy. I look in the tank, and only one was heavy. So now I know that she deposited an egg somewhere. I start looking on the glass, nothing. I, I look in the back, I, I get in, I move some plants around, I don't see nothing. I had a mop, I pull the mop out, I fan through the, the mop, I don't find anything. I'm like, what the heck's going on? So I grabbed the rock, and as I was picking it up, it slipped, and it fell into the sand. I'm like, oh man, you know, crush the fish. I picked it up and I turned it to the side to look for the, for the, uh, the fish to make sure everybody was okay. When it fell, the sand stuck to the egg. She laid every egg on the underside of the rock. <coughs> so if I wasn't paying attention that I seen that she threw the eggs, I just don't go through every, I have, three, I have 300 tanks. I don't go through and pick the rock up every day or every tank. Just look for eggs. So it was observation. You know when to go look for them. That same thing. They, they, now we know too that they deposit eggs in the sand. So I normally, if, my, if I have sand in a tank, it's usually just a thin layer. You can see right there. You can see the bottom of the tank. It's spray painted black, and I just put a thin layer of sand to give them that natural ability for them to go through the sift through the sand for their food and everything. It keeps their barbels clean and everything. And now they have that natural sand where they can kind of squirm down there and deposit the eggs. And what I do here is. Again, if I notice females, or I just think they may spawn, or I see spawning activities, males chasing females around, I'll go in the tank and I'll just go like this with my hand. The sand moves away, and if, there's, if they spawn, the sand stuck to the eggs. There'll be a cluster of sand that doesn't move, but it's stuck to an egg. And then you can pull the eggs out that way. So there's, there's kind of always ways of working around it. 
Aspidorus, airflow is very important. A lot of these quarries are found in, in water that's fast moving, streams, rivers, whatever. But it's usually one direction, again, be the fish, one direction of current. If you use a sponge filter, okay, or a box filter, the water, the bubbles go up, it pushes the water up, it hits the surface, the water hits the surface, causes a current, and it hits the sides of the tank and it goes back down. That's not a natural current that they would be having in the wild. It's usually a directional current. So if you use the pour it foam in the back of the tank and you have the discharge coming out, the water comes across the front of the tank, hits the glass, comes back down. So you have kind of a, a circular motion. It's a one direction current. I think that plays a lot of importance when you're talking about you know, liking a lot of current. This set up here would be the, the, the idea is you put the mop right in front of the current. You know, the current's in the back, but it's hitting the front glass. A lot of times the quarries will come up behind that mop and they'll lay the eggs on the glass behind the mop because the mops kind of cover for them, but it's in the current. So if you put it right in front, you just walk by the tank and you look, you look for the quarry eggs there. You'll see here in a few minutes, Corridor's Eber's Eye, when they spawn, they put two eggs, two eggs, two eggs, two eggs, maybe three eggs, two eggs, and they stick them all in the glass, usually right behind the mop. And they lay them two at a time, it's pretty cool. Question? Yeah. Have you spawned reticulatus? No. You just wait now. No, I have not. All right, good luck. <laughs> I'm not sure that they've even been spawned, to be honest with you. I don't, think so. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if anybody's ever spawned them. But uh, fish that like the current, all your aspidors like a lot of current. David Sands eyes, even Eber's eye, Nisa and I, pandas. Pandas, if you take that mop and sink it to the, excuse me, sink it to the bottom, they'll swim up from the underside into the mop that's in the current, and they'll lay their eggs inside the mop. And, and Cory pandas, for some reason, like to lay their, their eggs over like a three-day period. <coughs> so if you go in and you find eggs, if you take the mop out to put it in a hatchet container, put another mop in because there will probably be eggs in it the next day too. They do like a two or three-day spawning cycle or whatever. Corridor skeevers, I again, I'm gonna, with a lot of these talks, in case I miss it, there's the information down here. Check out the pH, how low it is. I do believe that a lot of these quarries that don't spawn is because we don't get the pH down far enough. Um, it's tricky. You've got to use RO water. You put the leaves, you maybe use some artificial additives, you use alder cones or oak leaves that start breaking down or the tea or whatever, and you get that pH down. And it, keep, it keeps getting lower and lower and lower. There's no buffer, so it's never going to go up. If you get called out of town on work or you get, you're working late hours and you don't go and check your fish, there's a certain point where the, it's ideal where it needs to be, it's just crazy low, and then the next time it drops a little bit, it becomes toxin and poison to them and it kills them. So you get something that you really gotta pay attention when you start playing, playing around with these really low pHs. But uh, nothing special with them. Uh, the the uh, TDS is pretty high temperature in mid 70s, but the, the, again, the main factor with these guys is that low pH. Beautiful fish out of the wild. This is one of Hans or George Evers, who the fish is named after, right out of the wild. And uh, again, I was telling you about how they lay the eggs, the two eggs at a time. It's pretty unique. And I see a little bit of sand and the, the debris stuck on that, which means that the fish was swimming around with the eggs. Um, so anyways, you see that first setup where the mop was in the front of the tank. What I do usually so I can see in the tank is I'll put the mop on the side and then I cut the discharge from the port foam on an angle. So the current comes out, hits it here. Now it causes a current this way. But again, I, I'm doing it for my ease, and it's still a pretty strong current. And this would be an ideal setup for Aspidorus. They don't care where the current comes from, and you'll see that in a minute. And then it's pretty easy to even on the side with the, with the mop moving, you can see if there's eggs behind it. But then I can see through the whole tank. Underneath here, there's a rubble pile. Oh, a second. The, the air's turned off, and what I did was I banked up rocks against the port foam. If you have that accidental spawning where they laid eggs somewhere and you missed it, there's a good chance that when, they, when some of the eggs hatch, the fry might make their way back to that rubble pile and you may end up getting a few fry that grow up in it. It's just kind of an extra thing. It, it's not hurting anything to do it. And it's, it's a kind of a, a unique thing to, uh, to, to try or incorporate. Corridors uh, Tenientes, the CW16s, the Lieutenant Corries. Uh, a buddy of mine, Don Kenyon, is doing great with spawning these. Everybody has difficulties. Uh, Rob has spawned them, or uh, Matt spawned them before. Um, I don't, Frank Falcone, another goofball hobbyist years ago, had spawned them. Uh, and uh, Don Kenyon in Virginia, they're the only ones I know in the US that have spawned them. Don spawns them like nothing. And I asked him what his secret was, and he says, Eric, he says, when you look at my tank, it looks like a tornado. The debris and detritus is just spinning around. 
the current, he says, I don't know how the fish can even live in the tank. It's just a whirlpool in his tank. And he says, and they lay eggs, they throw eggs everywhere. So it's just like, a, just this, this unbelievable current is what they love, and that's what the, the, the trick is. Uh, again, different types, I mentioned the different types of leaf structure. It's just a different feeling. The roots are different. It's a low light plant. I'm not big on keeping a lot of light in my tanks. I already hit on most of this stuff with the types of plants. And again, it's just a different texture. Um, Axel rod eye, oipoiensis, uh, Reynolds eye will spawn in a sunken mop, no problem. I mentioned about the Weitzman eye going over the top of the, uh, uh, the Java moss. That works also for Corridors Negros. Uh, I had these guys, Corridors, the C-115s, uh, 116s. Uh, these came from uh, Ian Fuller, Go Wild Peru, down in Madras Diaz, Peru. And uh, I, I bought eight fish from them. That, uh, they looked identical. They're kind of a long nose, sharper nose fish. And I couldn't tell male from female. These fish were pretty good size. They were two and three quarter inches pushing three inches. A lot of the, the sharp nosed quarries are a little bit more aggressive. So I put them in a 40 gallon tank and I was keeping an eye on them. And uh, that's probably two different sexes that you've just seen, but it, it's really hard to tell them apart. I had them in a tank, nothing special. It was just kind of a, a, even a quarantine tank for them. And they are up in, a, it was actually a partitioned off 40. And uh, they were in this setup. And after about a week of having them, I noticed them really active. You know, it was like a spawning activity where the males are chasing, where they're chasing each other around. And uh, so that's where the heck of it. I went up and I, I took some of the, the uh, floating plant matter out. And sure enough, there was these tiny eggs all through the plant matter. And they never, they never laid an egg on the glass or anything. So I sent the pictures, they're pretty small eggs. They have really tiny eggs, big fish with small eggs. And I, 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 I got in touch with Ian. I said, hey, Pops, I call Ian Pops. And I said, hey, Pops, I said, these, uh, these quarries are spawning, you know? I says, uh, the darndest thing, I said, not a single egg on the glass. They're, and I normally don't keep that much floating plant in. I just put it in there because I thought they were gonna be aggressive and it was just kind of, kind of uh, to break things up. So Ian says, well, there's good reason. That's where they're found. It's sand. There's really no rocks or anything in it, except for the overhanging vegetation. And he said, that's where they spawn in the wild. So this is my dumb luck was I, I hit the right, uh, the right conditions for them. And again, look at the sand. It's more of a lighter color substrate. Uh, most of the, I find out, I, I noticed in Joel's talk too, if you looked at the substrate on a couple of his shots, it was like white sand. And uh, I always kind of thought all the water as it weighs in Pennsylvania are all dark. You know, mud or silt or sand, everything's dark. So I kind of always thought that's the way it is everywhere. I'm starting to find out now that it's usually light colored, you know. And when I paint the underside of my tanks black and everything, it really changes the color of the fish. Uh, I was talking to some folks earlier. If you take a quarry and you on one of my tanks that has the black, just the underside, bare tank with just the, back, the, the black substrate, take pictures of that fish. Then put it on white sand and take a picture of an hour later and send it to a lot of well-known quarry people and say, Hey, what are these two fish? Any idea? And they'll say, well, the one on the left looks like this, the one on the right looks like that. What are they? I'm like, well, first of all, they're the same fish, taken an hour apart. One's on sand and one with white sand and one was on black. They change that much, you know? So when you're trying to identify stuff and you're looking in books, man, it could be crazy. A another thing to try if, if you don't want to play <laughs> around with, uh, you know, that much floating, uh, the bits and pieces of jab and loss and things like that, I learned from Rosario Lacourt, using my brain here, he goes out into the woods and he gets that moss, the lichen type moss that grows on decaying wood. And he spawns a lot of his tetras and barbs, minnows, danios, reservoirs, only the egg scatterers. And what he'll do is when you take it off of the uh, tree bark, you'll get some of these pieces of the dead wood and everything that's stuck to the roots of the moss. When you turn it like that, you put it in the corner of a bear tank. It, it, with your egg scatterers, if you put a male and a female separate and let them get fat and you put them together, the male goes, wah, women, and they spawn. You know, they're spawning either that night or the next morning, right? The only place where they lay their eggs is in the moss, okay? You just weigh it down with a couple rocks, or like Rosario would use a glass rod to weigh it down. And then um, what happens is you can take the parents out, you leave that in the tank, and by the time the eggs hatch, we usually with tetras would be a couple of days, they hatch, they stick on the side of the glass until they absorb their egg sac, another two or three days, and they go free swimming. All of this wood and detritus down there, it starts to break down and it produces infrasoria in the tank. So when the fish are ready to start free swimming, they have a tank filled with infrasoria from their spawning substrate. And it's all in one. It's crazy. It, it works out great. And if you go out in the woods and find it, it's, it's fun. It's an adventure. I mean, another aspect of the hobby. But uh, you can use that on your quarries too. Like it's, use that java moss on the bottom. You can use that natural moss. 
Uh, again, I just mentioned about some of the other fish that you could spawn in it. Okay, remember I, was, I always tell you about be the fish? And uh, a lot of your fish will spawn in plant roots, right? So I seen Regina making this mop one day, and I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Try to find a killifish egg or a fish egg, whatever, any fish egg, on a white mop. That's like, you know, working a puzzle oil to turn backwards, you know, upside down. And that's going to be super hard. And she looks at me and she goes, don't fish spawn in plant roots? I'm like, yeah. She goes, what color are most of the plant roots you know? Oh man, they're white, you know, she got me, he's like, be the fish, you know. <laughs> so again, something that obvious. And sure as heck, she spawned a ton of fish using these, uh, these white mops. And over the years, I found, and I, 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 don't even, I can't even recall what fish it is, but it's been at least three or four species. I always, when I make a mop, for whatever reason, ever since I was a kid, I like that dark green, uh, forest green or Kelly green mops, yarn to make my mops. I'll take a different colored strand, blue or red or brown or white or whatever. I'll take a different piece and tie it in the middle. And that there's, so there's two strands of that odd color. I like, it's like the center of the mop. I can find the center of the mop if I want. I don't know why I've just done it since I was a kid. So when you, when you float a mop, all that's hanging down, but you have these two different colored strands. Over the years, I found at least three or four different species. And Regina's had the same thing happen. Fish will spawn and they lay, always lay their eggs just on that one colored strand inside the mop. So they're probably doing it to camouflage their eggs. And uh, I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, fish are, you know, fish are a lot smarter than we think. Uh, the sand we use, I get it from the local stream. And the river, the, the stream of the river comes from the left to the right. And it actually makes like a sandbar. And you can get different textures of sand on different levels of the sandbar. And then take a six pack of beer with you, you can wash and clean the sand right there in the water. Take it home, and I just use scalding hot water to clean it, and boom, it's ready to go in your tank. A funny story about this is I've been using this for years, and uh, sometimes you get problems you just can't figure out. So I have a quarry system. Uh, last night, if you were here, you seen there was the three rows of tanks. There's five tanks, five tanks, five tanks. Top row in the middle, middle into the bottom. And I, have, I, I had to redo that system because I had this beard algae that was just, it took about a year, but it was just getting in the strainers. I have terrible problems with this beard algae <clears> everywhere. And uh, Corey, you remember that when you were there, it was oh, everywhere. You're talking about the hydrogen peroxide to get rid of it, which works. Good. But anyways, um, the, uh, the sand, I was using a lot of my tanks. And uh, I redid the whole system, and I, I got five tanks redone, and I started putting the sand in. There was only about three quarters of a cup of sand. Well, when I was breaking the tanks down, I found this glob. If you would take a quarter and squeeze it into a little bit of an oval, and it was black, and it was kind of hard, if you, but if you squeezed it, it would give a little bit. And it was gritty, but I couldn't get any grit off of it. It kind of reminded me of like an upon a Jeton ball that was buried in the sand or something. And it was rolling around the bottom of the tank. And I'm looking at it, and man, I, I studied it for five minutes. I'm poking and stabbing, I'm smelling it. You know, I wanted to taste it, but I didn't go that far, you know. And I'm like, what the hell is this? I've never seen anything in my life like this, right? So I go get Regina. Regina comes in, she's poking and everything, you know, she's looking at it. I think she did taste it, you know, but, but anyways, um, she goes, she runs off to it and she goes underneath the light and she comes back about five minutes later and she drops about, it's about a, this diameter of a dime, three high. She drops a magnet in my hand and I go, what's that? And she goes, that's what you gave me. I go, what are you talking about? She goes, that's what that was. I go, what was what was? That's a magnet. She goes, yeah, that glob you gave me was the magnet. I go, I don't know what you're talking about. She <laughs> said, all that stuff that was stuck to the magnet was iron ore sand from my sand that I collect. And I'm like, man, that's why my quarry system that I'm using straight RO and I have five five pH has a TDS of like 400 parts per million. <laughs> I got iron ore in there, and, and you know who would have thunk, right? So I take, a, I take a, 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 an algae cleaning mat and I put it in a plastic bag and I go through these tanks and I stick it down in the sand and the whole bottom is covered with iron or sand, you know? I'm like, wow, that's crazy. So now I'm going through all my tanks with this magnet to try to get all that iron ore out of there, get rid of the iron. But who would have thunk it, you know? Where did hey, the magnet what, come from? What's that? Was it a natural load soon or where did the magnet come from? Yeah, but I, somehow it got in the tank. I don't know, I never used a magnet like that for anything. So it must have came out when we were collecting sand or something. I don't know. I don't know where the magnet came from. 
but it's pretty neat. It was probably in there for a long time because that sand just kind of worked itself in to get kind of really hard and rigid. But uh, Ian was over and we went collecting. Uh, this was a man-made lake. They had white sand in there. That's that quarry system I was just telling you about. Uh, the thing about that too, let me hit about it because I didn't get on it that much yesterday. In this system, I'll keep a tank of uh, fish to breed. I have CW68s, they spawn pretty regularly. I'll keep them in one of those tanks. And this row here empties into here, which empties into here, goes to a filter and back up. And um, when that fish, that group of fish spawns, it releases pheromones and enzymes and proteins and everything to get to the water, and it triggers other groups to spawn. And probably the best trigger is if you know a storm's coming, the day before, get ice cold water. Do a big water change with ice cold water. If you have air stones or something, turn up the airflow or the water current, and uh, that's a great trigger to get them to spawn. So with those CW68s would usually spawn, and then within 12 hours, 8, 10, 12 hours, two or three other colonies that were ready to spawn would start spawning. So it does work. If you don't have a system that, that links together, take water if you have a group that did spawn, even if they're independent tanks, take a little couple cups of water from the one tank and pour it into some of your other tanks to get that pheromone in there to see if you can induce the spawning. And it, I, I, it does work, it definitely does work. In my old facility, I had the same thing. I had two racks set up like this, where the top row emptied into the bottom, and it, the same thing happened. I had the same effects with, uh, with uh, diluting it like that. Remember I talked about the current, and you know, the fish like the current? Well, they, they pick that where to spawn, and you can see where the discharge water's coming down, and you can see the eggs right in line of the current. Um, Aspidorus, remember I told you Aspidorus like current? They'll swim down the lift tube. That's like that one inch diameter rigid tubing that goes on the top of an ATI sponge filter. They'll swim down that in the current to lay their eggs. Okay? Now you want to see something really bizarre. This blew my mind. How is this for like a current? This is an uh, Aspidorus. They swam up the discharge of a power filter and lay their eggs out of the water, but it's in the water and that waterfalls. And that's what, I mean, that's telling you they like a current. You know, that's not telling you a current, not they did. I just seen that, I, that just, that's just incredible. So again, current is really an important part. Uh, Corridors equus is the only fish I've ever heard of. We tried to spawn them for years. And Regina, both Regina and I, we've never got any success. When we were over in Germany, uh, Karsten Gall, in that talk last night, the fish room where the mouse was running over Regina's head, Karsten Gall has had, had several generations of uh, Corridors equus. So we got to talking to him and he said the trick to him, stagnant water. No movement, scuzzy, dirty water, soft, acidic, like a swamp with no water movement at all. And that was the trick to spawn them. And I've never heard anybody say that or even try to do that with your quarries, the stagnant, dirty, nasty water. Uh, a river system works out pretty cool where you have the, the, the pumps over here, you pump it outside of the tank through a hose and then pump it back through so you have a current that's good for a lot of like your uh, hill stream loaches and things like that. That would be an ideal setup for a lot of quarries. Uh, Corridor uh, C45s. I got some of these from uh, Hans George Evers, and he was spawning them in a big. It was probably a 180 gallon tank, and they were spawning. And he was had a, a group of fry that just grew up in there. And uh, I took them home from him, and I had females who were heavy. I could never get them to lay eggs. He says, "What size tank do you have them?" And I basically told him oh, it was a 20 gallon high, and they're pretty good sized fish. They're like a, a, a solid three inch fish. And he says, yeah, he goes, you need, they need more room. They need a lot of activity. I'm like, really? You know, they got plenty of room to move. He goes, nah, put them in, put them in a four-foot tank. I put them in a four-foot tank. I had them for years. They didn't spawn. I put them in a four-foot tank. Within a month, they were spawning. And it was just because in nature, they had that much room. The natural schooling, a lot of activity. And a bigger tank was the catalyst to get them to spawn. Um, again, look at that, 4.6 pH. Now, a lot of times, quarries will spawn at a higher pH. Like these guys might throw eggs even at 70, at uh, pH 7.0, but no eggs will be viable. Same thing with the CW49s. Mine, if, if I'm just growing out tanks and you know, young adults getting to reach a maturity, if they throw eggs, the eggs are all snow white. They're never right, good right from the get go. You, once you get that pH down to 5.5, five, then you start getting good hatches from them. So get the pHs down. And there's just some inter interesting information on them. When you buy them, you want to keep them in groups or pairs. Um, I always used to try to buy my quarries in groups of 8, 10, or 12, try to do two males to one female. Um, I kind of throw that out the window anymore because it's a lot of times with these rare quarries, you don't have the chances of getting that many. You, somebody may only be willing to give you a pair or, or two pair or a trio or something. And you can still have success with that. 
Uh, I still like the idea of groups better, but don't give up hope if uh, you can only get a pair. It's still, it'll still work. A lot of times the colors can be ex very extreme. Uh, these, this is a male up here with no color. Uh, these are two females. This is, uh, you know, a little bit, this is really impressive. That's not so impressive. And the male is very attractive. It looks like this kind of an elegance. But uh, this is Nice and I. And uh, so they're, they're quite variable in color. Uh, Bilineatus is one. It's uh, very uh, variable, extremely variable. And um, those guys here, those Nice and I, I brought them back from the UK a year ago. And I put them in this tank with some uh, uh, Melantania Gary Langi. And I was just using it as kind of a quarantine tank. And uh, next thing I know, within about a week, they were spawning. They were throwing all their eggs up behind the mop. I was really surprised they spawned that quick. But uh, when they spawn, this is Corridor's Jerry Eye, uh, one of the bigger uh, three and a half inch size fish. And this right here is pretty interesting. They're in what's called a T position right now. And what happens is the, 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 the male gets in front of the female and she kind of like drives into him and he'll bend a little bit. And what's, they don't know exactly what happens, but the belief is that the, the female is getting the, the sperm, the milk from the male. And we don't know if she takes it in her mouth or if she just vents it and it, it sticks to her or if she you know, runs it on her body or she clasps it in her pelvic fins. We don't know exactly what happens, but she'll, she'll have the eggs clutched here and then do the T position, then she'll swim off and then throw the eggs. So if, if I see her swimming around and I see this, which is sand, I think the next slide is, uh, there's a profile picture of them there. And this one here, the, the male has all the color, the female doesn't. When they're not in spawning color, the males and females look alike. When they're getting in the condition to spawn, the male will get really nice reticulated pattern to them. So that's an indicator to you that you're doing something right. It's the type of season they're getting ready to go. And you can see how heavy the female is. But uh, when you see that sand uh, stuck on the, the fins, that's telling me that she was carrying that basket of eggs around with her for a little bit. She was swimming around a tank. And that's a fish where I would go look in the sand too for the eggs because there's a chance she's, she's throwing them in the, uh, in the sand. And it didn't help that she, or it helps you that there's some eggs on the glass as an indicator that they spawn. The CW 49s, uh, the black diamonds, you got to watch out with common names because they call Hestatus black diamonds also. And you know, you could go up in Pittsburgh and we'll call something one name, a common name, and you go to Youngstown, which is 80 miles away, and it's a different common name for the same fish. So common names are pretty tricky. Use the scientific names or the CW or C, uh, C numbers. If anybody doesn't know what this is, th this fish hasn't been described yet. And what happens is originally when you had an undescribed fish, a corridors, they would, they would uh, to keep track of it, they would apply a C number to it. And that's when Hans George Evers was working for uh, Dats Aquarium uh, magazine in Germany. And it was kind of the filing system for finding new fish. And um, you know, you think of new quarries, there's about 160 that are described. There's about 300 of them that are known and that aren't described that have C or CW numbers, and there's probably another 50 or 60 that have a species with a location or something. And I mean, you're, we're well over 450 different species of quarries. In a good old pet shop, you see three, but there's just a tremendous amount of them out there. So what had happened was the C numbers went up to, um, uh, maybe like up to 160 or something like that. And then uh, Hans left Dats Aquarium, and he started the, the Amazonas, uh, worked with the Amazonas in Germany many, many years ago. Well, they, people kept, the scientists and researchers and then collectors kept finding quarries. We well, need a way to categorize and catalog them so we know what fish we're talking about that came from which rivers or whatever. So um, that's what let them use the C numbers anymore because that was their filing system. So they use CW, which is for Corridors World, which is Ian Fuller's website, uh, Corridors World. So now Ian takes, takes over the, uh, the, the new, any of the new quarries that gets, uh, goes through him for the, uh, for the numbers for the filing system. So that's what the numbers are. But anyways, these guys here, again, the female is much bigger and bulkier than the male. Neat fish, I have some out there that you can check out. Uh, the female usually just carries one egg around in the basket and in, uh, in the pelvic fit here. She'll swim around, again, low pH on them. She'll swim around, deposit the eggs, and uh, they like the current. Uh, these guys are in the top row of that system. They'll lay a few eggs in the glass all over, and then they go in the back corner where the discharge water comes in, and they fill that whole corner up with eggs. And again, they'll spawn at a, at a higher pH, but uh, they won't hatch until you start getting down around the five. This is uh, CW69. This is the getting into the T position. Again, there's the female. You can see how heavy she is in the males. And uh, some quarries are scattering, like throwing, says throwing one egg at a time. These guys lay just clusters of eggs. 
and they'll go back over the same cluster again and same cluster again and they'll just kind of build up a mass and, and sometimes in certain areas you can see her basket that's filled with a whole bunch of eggs and these guys when they spawn these are pretty good sized fish pushing three inches they'll throw up to maybe 400 eggs or 500 eggs or so there's tons of them I had a group of these that was about 14 years old. They were still spawning and had high hatch rates, still viable and really good. I do believe also that a lot of your quarries need to reach sexual maturity. It may be six to eight years. You know, Aeneas, pandas, uh, palliatus will spawn within a year. But a lot of these quarries, I think, they, they didn't spawn because they didn't reach an age, a sexual age to spawn. Um, people will confuse age with size. I hear people say all the time, oh, they're, they're, they're big spa they're spawning size. Size doesn't matter, it's age. They need to reach sexual maturity by age, not the size. So a, a lot of them just got to hang on to them for a while. Corridors gracilis, again, look at how many eggs here. Uh, these guys prefer to lay their eggs. They'll throw a few eggs on the glass, but they'll throw 90% of their eggs on the underside of leaves. And uh, that's that tank again at Robert Babrukas. It was filled with leaf litter. And, uh, and the, the fries grow up with the, uh, with the adults. The eggs on those guys are small. And uh, I, I, I never knew what caused this. I was getting a lot of deformities. They would hatch and they would actually live for about two or three weeks or so. Then that would actually just destroy it, but they would never straighten up. And I didn't know if it was a genetic problem or whatever. And uh, Hans and a couple other guys when we were over at Corey Convention said it's probably a water chemistry problem. And it might be because of the, uh, the pH just getting down a little bit too low. And it's damaging the, uh, the embryos when they're developing. But uh, they're cool. They, the, the, the juveniles look just like the adults when they get bigger. Uh, Corridor CW69. These guys spawn in the, in the daytime. Um, big spawns, 150 eggs or so. Uh, high hatch rate. You can see a pH at 6. Um, very, very toxic. A lot of times the, the pectoral fins here, if they're orange, like stir by, the CW69s or uh, the Gossi eye, um, if they have the orange pectoral spines, they're really usually a high toxin producer. So that's definitely one that you want to agitate and stir up before you bag them up and move them or transport them or anything. So uh, a neat fish, um, these guys came mixed in with Corridor's Gossi eye. Now the description of Gossi eye says that it, they call it the spotted quarry. If you see in the head region here, under the under like the brown, you can see all the spots in the head region. Whereas if you look at this guy, and we won't look at that guy, uh, you'll see here in a minute. But uh, these guys, they're actually found together in the same waterways. And uh, again, these guys spawn nine times in sunlight. Late in the day when the sunlight was shining through a window and hitting the tank, they spawn, and that's not coincidence, nine times in a row, always late day in sunlight. Now, I consider when, I, when I'm hatching eggs, Keep, eggs are light sensitive, you want to keep them in the dark. Um, why they would spawn in direct sunlight is beyond me. The light can only hurt them, you know, it can only fun, cause them to fungus up. Keep them dark and retard the uh, retard fungus on them. But these guys, I kept trying to convince Ian that they were different fish. With the uh, 69s up top and then that spotted pattern, you can see all through the body on the gossi eye. And then the fry is the different, at the same age, look completely different. And Ian was like, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that they're two different fish. They're all gossi. They're found together. I was at a shop that had got a wild shipment in. And they had them in a big tank, a four-foot tank. They had a dozen fish. And seven were together over here that looked like that, that were all solid brown. And five were over here with the spotted heads. So I got a net, and I went and I scared the daylights out of them. They all schooled up together. Went back in the tank five minutes later, and there were seven that were all brown, and the five that were spotted over there. So. You may not be able to tell them apart, but they do can tell each other apart, and they naturally school with each other. So I was telling that to Ian, and he's like, yeah, you know what, that's, that's pretty convincing that they're different species, you know? So that's how the 69s got designated. Robinet and flag tail quarries, am I running short on time? I can't get over time. Okay, real quick, I'll run through a couple of things. Uh, very high toxin producers, parallelis, gorgeous fish, one of the neatest ones out there. Big high dorsal on some of the males. Fish are very, very expensive in Japan. They're still getting hundreds of dollars a piece for these guys. Uh, fryer, cute as could be. Um, again, that's what I was talking about the sand, Corridor's Bosmani. They lay the eggs one at a time. Female will swim around and around and around and around and around, and about a, a three quarters of a yingling beer later, they'll lay an egg. <laughs> and you go, you go, yeah, it is. You get drunk for this one, man. And then you just watch them and try to get the egg, that one egg right there. You get it out of there because the rest of the fish will eat it if you don't get it out. 
So they're really labor intense to collect a lot of eggs. Roll around the beliefs as you try to find them hiding out there. Um, again, they spawn on the glass, drop the water level down. I take a, a yarn, little yarn mop, uh, make a yarn mop around two fingers, scrape the eggs off, drop them down lower, then cover the tank. Put some, a couple drops of methylene blue or whatever, but put the rag on there to block out the light. Drop them at water level. Again, I mentioned about the shallow water. They'll hatch, you get tiny little fish. You take a sponge scrunch, squeeze it dirty, that's that little mop. You take sponge scrunch and you dump it into the tank and that's what they'll feed on. Fungus eggs, that's why you separate them because one egg will contaminate them all. Alder cones are a natural antifungal uh, and antibacterial. Put a couple alder cones in there, they coat a bad egg and it stops the fungus from spreading. You can put them in hatching tanks with notes of the dates and everything. There's the alder cones, a little hatching tank. The alder cones, they sell them in Europe. Regina and I collect them. There's the sponge grunge coming up. Uh, next food you could feed them is any of the powdered food, like the micron, throw some green water in, APR. Uh, micro worms or banana worms, micro walter worms next. Uh, I gut load my micro worms and walter worms with powdered foods, uh, vitamins, whatever, to gut load them. You get the more nutritional uh, uh, worm out of it in that way. And then move them on the brine shrimp. The triggers I mentioned already is current. Um, you know, something like waterfalls in the wild, you get a lot of aeration, heavy current and, and flow. A good diet, seasonal diets, seasonal changes, thunderstorm, light conditions, daylight, nighttime. Uh, again, water change before a big storm. And uh, the dry season, put them in a tank and torture them. Let the water evaporate, feed them a couple pellets once at once a week. Let the water evaporate to almost nothing. Move them into a big tank, put the light on, start feeding the heck out of them and uh, it simulates their, uh, their dry season. Uh, age might be a factor I talked about. Look for the buried eggs I talked about. Separate, you know, with egg scatter, if you separate males from females, you put them together, ah, female, they spawn. Why not do that with egg layers too? You know, absence makes the heart grow fonder for sure. Uh, use a dither fish, I mentioned that yesterday. If, um, if all the bottom line fish, there's always fish above them. And then when they, those fish scatter, the, the bottom feeders scatter too because there's a predator around. So throw some dither fish with it, on some danios or gummies or something, whatever. No substrate, uh, no light, we'll talk about that. It used to be UV sterilizer, you have bacteria in the water. Uh, patience, you gotta spend time. And that's, that's it. Thank you. I just wanna say thank you to Eric Bodrock and the Cataclysm crew, it was a great event. And we're so lucky that uh, both of them, both Eric and Cataclysm, let us film. That's not something they had to do. It's something they chose to do. So I hope that everyone attends Cataclysm next year and you guys invite Eric out to speak at your club. I know you just watched his talk here, but he gives a lot of different talks. And uh, in person is way different than online. Like, you, you know, you're going to watch, you get your information, but you can't ask your questions. The talks usually change each time a bit. And uh, the overall experience is unbeatable. So hopefully we'll see you in Cat or at Cataclysm in 2019. And uh, CatCon's coming up in 2018. So we'll see you there. Thanks for subscribing. On the left, we have our latest video. Make sure you check that out. On the right, we have more videos lined up for you, which we think you'll enjoy if you enjoyed this video. Down below, we have the Jimmy of Aquarium Co-op channel. Make sure you check that out, and we'll see you in the next one. Ooh.